In the case of, of, of Island Lake, 13,000 people in the span of two weeks uh, will not have any road access. So how do you get a field hospital in there? Tonight, concerns over how remote and isolated First Nations will combat COVID-19. People who attended the PDAC conference and are feeling well are being advised to self-monitor for two weeks after they left the conference. And how is Nunavut preparing for the pandemic? Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. The continuing response from Ottawa to COVID-19 came fast and furious today, starting when news that Parliament will be shut down till uh, April 20th. APTN's Todd Lamrand reports that out of all of the announcements today, nothing was specific to Indigenous people, beginning with the Prime Minister. Justin Trudeau emerged from Rideau Cottage in Ottawa, where he and his family are in self-quarantine. After his wife, Sophie Trudeau, tested positive for the virus on Thursday. The Prime Minister announced a multi-billion dollar stimulus package to help Canadians through the pandemic. No one should have to worry about paying rent, buying groceries or additional childcare because of COVID-19. We will help Canadians financially. Ministers from the COVID-19 Cabinet Committee held their own press conference today to discuss hygiene practices and travel restrictions. Health Minister Patty Haydu reassured as she'd been in constant contact with her provincial and territorial counterparts. And we will be there beside the provinces and territories every step of the way and I'm so pleased to see so many of them step up in innovative ways to make sure that we can continually screen our population, test people, make sure that people have access to services as they need. But neither Trudeau nor his ministers had much to say about Indigenous people or their communities. On Thursday, Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller said that $100 million of a $1 billion COVID-19 response fund was earmarked for Indigenous people. But Conservative Senator Dennis Patterson said in a statement released Friday that amount was not enough, something NDP MP Nikki Ashton agreed with. We've asked the minister for more details about what that 100 million looks like. Uh, but what I heard right away from leaders on the ground, uh, 100 million to deal with a pandemic with First Nations that are already stretched uh, is not going to go very far. Ashton also asked for the military to be on call to help remote and isolated First Nations in her riding. Uh, I mean, in the case of, of, of Island Lake, 13,000 people in the span of two weeks uh, will not have any road access. So how do you get a field hospital in there? How do you get modular housing? How do you get major quantities of running of potable water? Late Friday afternoon, Trudeau held a telephone conference with Indigenous leaders. But as we went to air, we still hadn't learned any details yet. Todd Lamaran, APTN National News, Ottawa. Thanks for that, Todd. As the World Health Organization officially declared the COVID-19 virus a pandemic this week, a number of big events and celebrations have been cancelled over concerns of the virus spreading throughout Canada. Confirmed and presumptive cases have tripled in Canada since last Friday. While none have been confirmed in any Indigenous communities, many groups and organizations are looking at preventative measures. Brittany Hobson gives us a look back this week at what to expect going forward. Manitoba reported its first confirmed case of COVID-19 on Thursday, March 12th. Two presumptive cases were also identified. With the virus now in Manitoba, many First Nations in the province are wondering how to protect themselves. Dr. Brent Rusin, the province's so chief provincial uh, public health officer, says testing, testing will be available in communities. Uh, Obviously, it takes uh, longer to get the test to the lab, um, but, uh, but certainly testing um, can be available there. Manitoba is one of seven provinces with reported cases of the virus as of March 13th. It's also one that has a contentious past with pandemics. In 2009, the federal government sent body bags to remote communities in response to the H1N1 virus. The provincial government says it's doing its part to make sure proper supplies are provided this time. We have worked with First Nations and Inuit Health Branch to make sure that we order our supplies together so that we have enough for everybody in the province and are working with EMS and patient transport if they do need to come to Winnipeg that we can get them here expeditiously. The Manitoba Métis Federation is taking action. The group has purchased three mobile homes 
which will be used in cases where people need to self-isolate. What do we do with a family uh, that has corona in, in, a in a small community, small village with no resources, no health supports? How do you isolate them when they're overcrowded? So we have to have a solution. We obviously can't wait for the province to say, okay, let's put the Métis in our agenda. They're not doing it at this point in time. Federally, the Liberal government faced criticism for its response for prevention in Indigenous communities. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller suggested quarantine tents could be sent. NDP MP Charlie Angus bashed the idea. If COVID-19 hits a community like Bearskin Lake or Keshechuan, we're in the nightmare scenario because how do you self-isolate in a home of 21 people full of mold? And so the minister's plan is to bring in tents. What, in James Bay in March? That ain't going to cut it. When are we going to see a sense of urgency to protect the lives of First Nation people? Over the course of the week, several events were cancelled, including the Little Native Hockey League Tournament in Mississauga, the Junos in Saskatoon, and the Arctic Winter Games in Whitehorse. While cases have tripled in the country, public health risks associated with the virus are still considered low. Dr. Barry Lavallee says washing your hands often is still the best way to prevent the spread. Specific time, uh, times, like uh, if you've taken care of a sick person, uh, before you uh, get food ready, uh, when you go to the toilet, um, if you actually visited somebody who was sick, uh, protecting yourself in that way. That's one of the main things. Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News. In response to the pandemic, the Haida Nation has issued a letter to members asking no one to leave the island off the coast of BC until further notice. And for those who have been away, be extra diligent with hand washing and avoiding others if you have flu symptoms. The Namaska First Nation in Quebec, meanwhile, has shut its doors to travelers from abroad. They are putting members up in hotels in nearby towns for two weeks of isolation if they've been away. In the days ahead, we'll keep you, of course, uh, updated on what's being done to reduce the risk of the virus making its way into isolated communities where there's often sick or aging populations, overcrowding, and minimal medical responsibilities. In southern Ontario, Canada's largest First Nation declared a state of emergency. With close to 13,000 members who live on reserve, Six Nations of the Grand River is closing all schools until April 6th. And a COVID-19 testing site will be established within the community. The announcement was made by the Emergency Control Group and Six Nations elected Chief Mark Hill. At 6.25 p.m. on Thursday, March 12th, 2020, the Six Nations Emergency Control Group declared a community emergency for our territory. This was done in response to the World Health Organization's declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic and call for prevention and protection to ensure the most meaningful measures of preparedness for Six Nations. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations says they are taking precautions to keep their members safe. At a press conference in Saskatoon, the FSIN said that they sent all non-essential staff to work from home for the next two weeks. They are also prohibiting all staff from traveling outside the province and country until further notice. They made the rec recommendation for their member uh, First Nations to do the same, but also said that it's up to each community to take action. The FSIN is cancelling uh, all, all upcoming large gatherings as well. We wanted to take the extra precaution and uh, be proactive in addressing and combating uh, COVID-19. As with any organization or company and business across Canada, uh, we, we felt it necessary to, to make the decision to, uh, to halt, cancel and postpone all major events, gatherings, meetings, forums, conferences. First Nations leaders in northwestern Ontario are, are trying to keep up with the spread of the virus. Anishinaabeaski Nation and Grand Council Treaty 3 called for organizers to postpone two major hockey tournaments. Both the Northern Bands Tournament in Dryden and the Little NHL in Mississauga have since cancelled their event. Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler says travel restrictions are in place for staff and they're working with communities in to update their pandemic plans. The fact that we still have 18 boiled water advisories and then uh, that's an issue to um, wash your hands with clean water or when we tell people to, uh, if they feel that they have symptoms of this virus that they 
uh, seek uh, the advice of a health professional, which we don't have in many of our communities, or to self-isolate, you know, that because of overcrowding uh, in our homes, but also in our uh, nursing stations, that there's very limited space where you can uh, actually isolate people. So it's time for a quick break, but when we come back, a troubling number of sleep-related infant deaths in Manitoba. First, here's tomorrow's weather forecast for the east and central parts of the country. Starting off on the east coast, we've got two in snow in Fredericton, minus two in snow in Charlottetown. La Grande River, minus 13 in snow. Kujuac, minus 14 in snow. Sedil, zero in snow. Quebec City, snowing and four degrees. Peterborough, sunshine and five. Sarnia, three in sunshine. Campus Casing and Timmins, minus five in snow. Minus 14 in sunshine for Big Trout Lake. Minus 11 for God's Lake, Norway House in the Paw. Sunny skies there. Minus 9 with a mix of sun and cloud for Dauphin. Minus 7 in Barrows River and Princess Harbor. Minus 7 in snow in Regina. Minus 12 in snow in Saskatoon. Minus 17 for Buffalo Narrows and sunny skies. Minus 16 in sunshine for Uranium City. Welcome back. Manitoba's advocate for children and youth released a new report on infant deaths in the province. She found that overcrowding and poverty in First Nations were causing an alarming number of child deaths. The report reviewed over 1,000 deaths between 2009 and 2017 and found that 145 infants died unexpectedly in their sleep before the age of two. 83 of those 145 deaths involved First Nations infants. 58% of deaths occurred in households that made less than $35,000 a year. Children's advocate Daphne Penrose believes that poor living conditions were a major cause of infant death. We found that, um, you know, accessibility to safe sleeping surfaces, overcrowding were part of why that was happening um, and why we were seeing an overrepresentation, lack of health care services, all of the things that are related to, uh, you know, colonization um, still uh, really impacting infants and uh, equal access to health care. Eight First Nations have agreed to consultations on an 800-kilometer natural gas pipeline that will run from, the eastern, from eastern Ontario to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Quebec. The company Gazaduk confirmed, uh, quote, engagement agreement has been signed with the Anishinaabe Atikamekw and Innu people whose territory will be affected. The agreement called uh, Mamogaki does not equal consent for the project. Each of the First Nations involved can still decide on their own if they want the pipeline. Uh, the signing follows news that an American investment company pulled out of the project, fearing a Wet'suwet'en-like crisis. There was a, a, a media announcement last week that one of the investors for the Gazaduke project on Gazaduke's side has pulled out. Um, we have, of course, nothing to do with that. And so I think the very near term, as the press release indicates, there's a bit of um, uh, regrouping on Gazaduke's side uh, as to what it, it will be able to do. And so we're going to have to wait a little bit to find out what that regrouping looks like. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Nunavut has cancelled its annual mining symposium, an event that brings hundreds of people to Iqaluit each year. Our Kent Driscoll shows us how Nunavut is preparing to slow the spread of the pandemic in that territory. Nunavut's annual mining symposium brings 400 people and three quarters of a million dollars to Iqaluit's economy. Now it is cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Seven employees of Nunavut's Economic Development and Transport Department are under self-monitoring protocols, a step below self-isolation. They attended the PDAC mining conference in Toronto, where delegates were exposed to COVID-19. People who attended the PDAC conference and are feeling well are being advised to self-monitor for two weeks after they left the conference. And self-monitoring, you can still work, but you should be careful at work to avoid physical contact, to maintain some separation between yourself and your nearest co-worker, or consider working behind a closed door or even working from home if that's an option, and avoid um, a lot of gatherings like parties or weddings, uh, events like that. Last week, Dr. Michael Patterson, Nunavut's Chief Public Health Officer, 
told us that fewer than five people had been tested for COVID-19 in Nunavut. Now, due to a change in how the lab work is done, there are many more. Is one of our lab partners in the south has uh, started doing COVID-19 testing in their own lab and as part of their validation process and as part of what we call sentinel surveillance, they've gone back and tested other swabs that have been collected for influenza and RSV and they sent us a number of returns and I, I can't remember the exact number right now, uh, but they sent us at least 10 s results that were all negative. According to Stats Canada, 56% of Nunavut residents live in overcrowded housing. That leads to easier spread of disease. An example, Nunavut's tuberculosis rate is 62 times the national average. Infectious disease thrives in Nunavut. And how do you isolate yourself when you live in overcrowded housing? You do the best you can, and uh, as we've discussed before, we're, uh, an option under those circumstances is to admit somebody for isolation for a brief period of time. Or the health department confirmed today that if anyone tests positive for COVID-19, we will be told what community that they do live in. So until then, just keep washing your hands. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. While health, while health officials and politicians are instructing Canadians to be mindful of social spacing, inmates in Canadian prisons don't have that luxury. About one-third of them are Indigenous. Senator Kim Pate is asking for correctional centres to act on this pandemic. She says that prison administrators are not responding quickly enough to address the overcrowding and says that options like accelerated parole and release programs should be considered. This is a time more than ever that we should be looking at uh, using those measures to get people out, allow them to be in their communities, to be with their families, to be, you know, I, I have said that they could be using all kinds of work release and uh, compassionate release provisions as well. It's time for us to take another break, but coming up, the remains of two Bayotuck are returned to Newfoundland after 200 years in a Scottish museum storage. And here's the rest of tomorrow's weather for the West and the North. In northern Alberta, we got lots of sunshine. Minus 13 in Fort Chip, sunny skies. Minus 17 in snow for Edmonton. Minus 17 in snow for Lethbridge. Eight in sunshine for Tofino. Bella Coola is sunny in three. Minus five in sunshine for Fort Nelson. Minus eight in sunny in Prince George. Minus five in sunny for Beaver Creek. Minus three in snow for Old Crow. Norman Wells, snow in minus six degrees. Minus nine in Watty and Yellowknife. One and cloud for Fort McPherson, Apologic minus 19. Chesterfield minus 26 in sunshine, minus 24 in Repulse Bay. Joe Haven minus 24 in snow. Resolute makes a sun and cloud in minus 29. Clyde River minus 26 in snow. The remains of two of the last known Bayotuk people who were indigenous to Newfoundland and became extinct after contact with Europeans have been returned to Newfoundland earlier this week after almost two centuries in Scotland. The surprise announcement came Wednesday when a special ceremony was held in St. John's involving the Premier and Indigenous leaders from Newfoundland and Labrador. Mizel Joe, chief of the Amyaba Gang First Nation, is here. Uh, thanks for joining us, Chief Joe. So the arrival of the of Bayotuk remains uh, earlier this week, how, it was a surprise to some of us. Uh, you've been working on this, though, for a long time to have these remains repatriated, the, the group that you work with. How did you feel when they made their way back to Newfoundland? Well, it's an incredible feeling. Uh, the night that they arrived in Newfoundland, uh, there was quite a crowd of uh, politicians and Aboriginal leadership there. It was a a great moment, but I think yesterday was probably more of a spiritual moment, uh, thinking back on when I first saw the remains and thinking about the 200 years that they've been gone. Yeah. It was it was an incredible uh, day yesterday, and even, even today it's still around. I could feel the presence of something that wasn't wasn't there before, mm. even though they're very locked in a box at the museum. It's still a pretty special spiritual moment. Yeah. Was it just the remains that were returned? I understand there were some cultural items that had been uh, robbed from their grave as well. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what's in. I, I haven't seen inside the box once it I arrived in uh, at, the, at the ruins, but I'm sure in time I'll get a chance to see.
Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, can you tell us the story about Damastuit and uh, Nonos uh, Sabasut? Yeah, basically there were uh, two people that were shot on, uh, on the ice up in, I believe it was Red Indian Lake by uh, John Payton Jr. according to the history and the documentaries that I've seen. Uh, they were shot simply because uh, John Payton Sr. blamed him for stealing something that belonged to him and convinced uh, his son to go along with other people and shot them on the ice. And it was in 1827, I believe, that Cormac decided he would go back and take their take the skull from those two bodies and bring them to Britain for study. Uh, and so the oral history, uh, this is interesting to me too, so uh, Mi'kmaq oral history on the island talks of relations between the Mi'kmaq and the Bayotek. Uh, and we recently heard that Miabugeg is doing a genetic study to better understand that relationship. What can you tell us about your ancestors' uh, relations with the Bayotek uh, and why the DNA matters today? Well, DNA is basically done for health reasons and not to uh, show a connection between us and the other people. Um, you know, we, we grew up with uh, oral history knowing that there was uh, a connection between the two groups of people, our Mi'kmaq people and the Biotic people, and that there was intermarriage. And there was also um, a group of Mi'kmaq people that helped to smuggle, uh, in the later years, to smuggle some Biotic people out of Newfoundland into, on into Nova Scotia. And some of those uh, people went on to places like New Brunswick and married and went on into the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the history that I know, but uh, for sure, there was uh, small groups of people, uh, big other people still living in 1822 when uh, my relative, Sylvester Joe, uh, guided Cormac, who was an explorer from Scotland, mm -hmm. across the island. He was the first non-Aboriginal person to walk across the island. And at that stage, he was looking for uh, biotic people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that 1822, there were still people alive then. It was only a few years later, five years later, I believe, when uh, he went to take those skulls from uh, their resting place. Where should the remains go now? You said that they're still in a box uh, in, in St. John's. Where should those remains go? Well, when, when we had uh, the gathering a few nights ago, uh, the Premier said they're home. And, and I didn't mean to be... Uh, you know, I'll correct the premier, but those remains are not home yet. They're in Newfoundland, yes, but they're not home. I think uh, there should be a discussion be between us and government and uh, other people mm -hmm. uh, to decide where those remains should go. And certainly not in the ground somewhere because uh, they're so famous that they wouldn't last very long. Somebody would take them, but we, yeah. we need to find a place somewhere that uh, is sacred and protected and respectful in a way of, of putting them to rest. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for this. Uh, we'll, we'll wait and see how this all unfolds and where, uh, where they go, but it's nice that they're closer to home than they were. Yes, it's a long journey yet, but uh, they'll get there. Thank you. Thank you. We are all out of time for your news tonight. Keep up to date with the APTN News on your app on your smartphone. If you don't have it, get it. Uh, there's going to be... Uh, oh, that's not the right thing I'm supposed to be reading. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night. I'll see you back here tomorrow.